Asian Net Land. Um, so feel free to tweet or to take pictures or anything like that. I do ask that if you ask questions, please ask them loudly so our online audience can hear them as well. We may be getting some questions via Twitter through the evening. So if you see me scurry up here to hand uh, Jane a card, that means we've got a question from our online audience. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, you should tweet at Dramatist Guild, hashtag new play. I think that's everything. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'm very happy to introduce Spence Porter, who is my counterpart at Harvard Lit. Hooray. Hey, Spence. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I really love these joint events with the Dramatist Guild. And uh, this one is going to be a lot of fun. Now. Our, when Joe and I start talking about the event, we decided early on that <coughs> the ideal interviewer would be a top stand-up comic. Ooh. And we landed one of the best. Oh. Yes. And this is why we love Spence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let me add that she is not here to be funny tonight. You know, don't go looking at her saying, when is the joke happening? Where's the joke? She's here as interviewer. But the reason we wanted a, a stand-up comic was we wanted somebody with real understanding <coughs> of what Joe's here to talk about. And, uh, and okay, Jane was the 2004 grand winner of <coughs> Ladies of Laughter. In 2007, she was the New York audience favorite at last comic standing on NBC. And uh, in, this is a weird progression, but in 2011, she was the commencement speaker at Wellesley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make sense? Comedy career <laughs> taking off. <laughs> and Joe has so many credits, it would take all night to list them. So I'm going to only mention what's relevant to the subject tonight, which is from 1983 to 1990, he was a writer for David Letterman. Then from 1993 to 1995, he was the mm -hmm. head writer for Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. And then he returned to David Letterman from 1995 to 2001 as writer and head writer. And uh, he knows late night television. <laughs> And let me also mention his book is available for purchase. There'll be a book signing after the interview. <laughs> and of course, if there are any of you who really do not want to become fabulously successful in late <laughs> night television, you should not fail under any pressure to buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf yeah. of his wife and children. <laughs> 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 and so now let's welcome Jane Condon and Joe Tucker. Thank you. Thank you, Spence. Thank you, Spence. Can I go first? Okay. Okay. Nice to meet you, Joe. Nice to meet you. Very nice. To, I feel odd Everybody. sitting down. I'm a stand-up comic, but... We, we can stand up. It, it, Whenever well, you get the urge. No. It's okay. Well, I'll do it. Anyway, this is okay. the book, Comedy Writing for Late Night TV. Yeah. And I am so glad that Spence asked me to do this because it's a book I might have read, but I definitely read, and I really learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's a, a lot you. of things that comics think, but maybe we didn't put <coughs> words to. Yeah. Um, and, like, I thought there were really just three rules of comedy. Uh, the letter K is funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Rule of three. And the third rule is there, there are no more rules. But you had, like, 12 joke maximizers but yeah we'll we'll get to that okay. okay what I wanted to say was um just my upfront disclaimer just that uh, it is a joint production of Harvard Wood and the Dramatist Guild and um I, I just want to tell all you Harvard Wood people I myself I did not go to Harvard College okay <laughs> but I slept there okay <laughs> so I just <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> anyway witness the offspring in the back okay so um <laughs> Beside, you started at Letterman, I, Leno, I, I, Letterman. I, I slept at Wellesley. You slept at Wellesley. What a good boy. Thank you. Um, but I guess what kind of astounded me was, and I can tell by reading the book that you really earned it, you have four Emmys. So I just, I was just 
where are they in your house? And what does one do when one has uh, an Emmy? That's all. The Emmys are in my office upstairs, just on the tops of bookshelves. Like Joe, I they're love just, you. Yeah, up in the safe place where I won't knock them over. They're they're very delicate. The base. Oh, they're delicate. Yeah, well, it, yeah, you have to hold them properly, otherwise they How might snap off. How much do they weigh? Are they heavy or? Uh, yeah. Seven pounds, maybe, something like that. Yeah. So, but but there's a weak point down around the base. You always have it's like oh. a baby. You have to support its head. Oh, you know, oh, oh, so, so it cute. Doesn't snap so cute. Off. The people <laughs> are saying yes over here. Yeah. The Simpsons writer Mike Reese and his wife Denise who have won several Emmys too. Yes. Yeah. So that's yeah. all right. We got Emmy here. We got Emmy there. We got Jane it's, in the middle. Okay. It's, it's for group writing. I, I I won those Emmys in the '80s for for the Letterman show for Late Night with David Letterman, and we just we hit our stride. That's we were just wonderful. just every year we yeah. uh, the, the writing staff as a whole won it an Emmy. So it's a, it was a, a collective again. win for for the whole staff. Well, no, don't be modest. Just take we take all, all the credit. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Oh. Or was that Isaac Newton said? Yeah. Well, that that's very nice. Anyway, let's start with the uh, your origin myth take us from zero to letterman you know where you're from sure. parents i i have a, a kind of a weird story about how i got into writing and, and show business it, it really started in high school uh, which is where i i got really good grades but that that really was a problem because i i was, I was right i'm not trying to brag but yeah i got good grades in math and science and also in english and i was really confused about what i wanted to do because i you know i could do a lot of stuff but the class I really enjoyed the most was English class. I think it was freshman year. We had an assignment where every night we had to write for 20 minutes in a journal. And I, I remember I always looked forward to that. Just we, whatever we wanted to write, we could write as long as we wrote for 20 minutes. And that was the high point of my, my homework session. And so I should have paid attention to that and, and said, oh, maybe I should try doing that later on professionally. But but I didn't. Uh, I majored in engineering and applied physics at, well, at Harvard. Of course, it's an obvious thing. <laughs> a lot of people in engineering going into comedy writing? <laughs> you know, there are probably more people than you think, uh, oh, really? than you might imagine with math really? backgrounds. Yeah. Oh, that's um, interesting. That's and interesting. I think it has to do with, like, uh, Mike and I know, I think George Meyer was a math major, maybe. And uh, there's a, at least one friend of mine who was uh, on The Letterman Show. Who, that's uh, interesting. Who was working on the Big Bang Theory, and he's a... Uh, oh. I think yeah. he was a science major. So yeah, and I think it all has to do with um, solving problems and solving puzzles. Yeah. You're writing a joke, I think, is like creating you're a puzzle. You're a craftsman. Yeah, you're crafting, yeah. A, you're crafting a, a, a puzzle that will accomplish something, or a, a, right. a, a device that will accomplish something, in this yeah. case, making somebody laugh. Right. Just like in engineering, you, you might write a computer program to do something. And I know that makes it sound really formulaic, but I, I think... Uh, a lot of the same skills kind of kind of overlap. No, I get, I totally get it. And where are you from? And what your I'm from Boston. Yeah. So I went to to Harvard, and that was where I, I was. I first wrote comedy uh, on a regular basis. Uh, was for the Harvard Lampoon. Okay. And so that was another exposure to, to comedy that I should have should have filed <laughs> away, and I should have said, you know, I really I really enjoy doing this. Maybe I could do this professionally. But at the time, it, it wasn't a well known. Uh, right. career path. It was, wasn't something you go to Harvard, you major in engineering, oh, I'm going to write comedy. <laughs> but there was a, there was a, a member of the Lampoon who, uh, Jim Downey, who was one of the early writers on Saturday Night Live. So he kind of showed everybody that, that this was something that you might do professionally. And, uh, and after I graduated, I worked for a couple of years, went to Harvard Business School, got an MBA, uh, so I'm Engineering moving further and, and further and away. MBA. This I know. Is I'm like, you're a very interesting career from, path. Yeah, I just uh, eventually uh, it was it was just an opportunity presented itself. Uh, Jim Downey was working as head writer for for Dave Letterman, and he and a bunch of other writers were going to be leaving the show to, to to work on another show, other shows, and he mentioned that there were going to be these uh, open writing slots, oh. and he said, "Oh, if you've ever that's wanted to fantastic. write, would you like to write a submission?" So that's what I did. Right. So it's kind of. It was, it, it was basically uh, a contact that I made on the Lampoon, who was right, my right. first entree. But also, I, I had to write a writing sample, and I had to impress eventually Dave that that I might be capable of doing this. It sounds like the Steve Jobs speech, the Stanford commencement speech, where he said, oh. "You connect the dots afterwards." Of oh, I had to do this, and then it led yeah. to that, and zigzag. But yeah, yeah, and I think one another good thing about getting the MBA is was. You know, it's not, it's a terrible reason to get an MBA, but it, I felt like it was sort of a safety net that that if if it didn't work out, if this crazy idea of 
writing for TV comedy didn't work out. But it really but helped say, you right, with Jay Leno. Do you want to tell them how sort of the branding marketing thing? It was interesting oh, to me. Yeah. Well, when I eventually, so I worked for for Dave Letterman for six years at, at NBC on on the twelve thirty show. Eventually went out to California, worked out there for six years, and during that time I worked on a sketch show in Living Color, and then went into sitcoms, which is my my goal of moving out there. Is I wanted to write story more instead of uh, just a shorter form comedy. Uh, it, but then I I, got, I found myself back in late night again. Mm -hmm. I worked for the Chevy Chase show. I was co-head writer of the Chevy Chase show, <laughs> uh, which is. Uh, Routinely listed on the worst uh, list of the worst <laughs> shows of all time. TV Guide, I think it's number 18 on, on the list of 50. But that that was the job I had immediately before working for for Jay on the Tonight Show. And at the time, the Tonight Show was was really getting clobbered by by Dave Letterman, who had moved from NBC to CBS when he didn't get the Tonight Show job. He didn't get to succeed Johnny Carson. So Dave came on the air at CBS and and uh, was really just just really clobbering Jay at the Tonight Show in the ratings and and also critically and about a year and a half into Jay taking over the Tonight Show he uh, Chevy Chase show went went belly up and, and I moved over to the Tonight Show and, and that was really an opportunity to to, to think as a, as a as an MBA and I know. say this is I a competitive that was situation. So interesting. He has it's this whole chapter about Jay versus Dave and the late night yeah, wars. He was in happened. the middle of it but and yeah. you start out as a financial analyst at Columbia Pictures, and that did you just look around and say, I can do this? Uh, writing? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you were in, you had a foot I, in the door. I made a half step into show business. Interesting. Yeah, I, I moved yeah. from, I was in marketing at General Foods. I was marketing dog food, yeah. because I thought that would be a <laughs> kind of a creative way to use my, my MBA. <laughs> and it was a, a little bit, but not enough. So then I said, all right, I want to get inside, at least get inside an entertainment company. <coughs> Went to Columbia and then from there to, to Dave Letterman. But, uh, but I did have that way of looking at my marketing. My marketing background, my MBA gave me a, a, a way to look at something competitively. We're a show. We right. have a competitor. Right. What can we do that right. really well that, that he can't do as well? What does he do really well that we can't compete against? Uh, right. And, and then it was just a matter of just rolling up our sleeves and saying all right how do we how do we get how do we get this lost ground back yeah how do we fight our way back and they did it, once you read this chapter it was it, within two years well hugh grant Jay helped had, hugh grant yes hugh grant i, I make a, <laughs> a, a a marketing analogy there hugh grant was our our, our uh, two dollar coupon when you're, when you're <laughs> lunch, uh, hugh grant got us sampling but we had to do the product improvement first right, right. this is all uh cycle dog food you know you have to you have to improve the product, and then you drop the high Remind value coupon. Remind them the Hugh Grant. To, oh, the Hugh Grant story Jay is Jay Leno's uh, line. Hugh, yeah, he, Hugh Grant uh, was involved in this scandal where he picked up a, a prostitute on Hollywood Boulevard, and it was a big scandal. It was all over the news, and t to his credit, he had been booked on Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and and didn't cancel. He knew he was going to be subjected to this this intense media heat, so he gets on the show. He sits down, and Jay's first question is. What the hell were you thinking? Just, it's just, just a perfect way to sum up what, what everybody <laughs> was, was thinking and just the perfect question. So predictably, the ratings that night were huge. A lot of people tuned in for that. They sampled the new kinds of comedy that we had started doing on the show that maybe they hadn't seen before right. because they right. saw Jay and, and left it for Dave or whatever. And, uh, and so they sampled the show, and then we made sure that the comedy that week was strong so that if they stuck around, they'd say, oh, this is, this is a, a funny show. And, and it worked. And it worked. At, at that point, we had a new studio that maybe they hadn't seen before. That was another key move. Uh, Jay moved out mm -hmm. of Johnny's old studio and, and uh, into a brand new studio that was much, much better set up for his way of performing, which is he likes to be close to the audience. He's a club performer. Oh, yeah. Does that, does that yes. make sense? Yeah, you like yes, to see the totally. people. Totally. And totally. I'm happy this is a small room and people are close. This makes me yeah. very happy. You hate when you go into a, a situation where there's a dance floor. <laughs> like, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, hello. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So what I, what I really learned the most from this book is um, when, when I think of late night TV writing, I really think of the monologue jokes. Mm. And I had no appreciation until reading this that it's monologue jokes plus desk pieces plus... Um, 
Well, that's audience pieces plus field pieces. Right. And each one is its own little genre. So if any of you are thinking of doing a late night submission packet, you really have to learn to excel in all of those yes. packets uh, it, or sections. It's it's a, a, a form of comedy, and I call it short <laughs> form comedy. That, yes, that yeah. Yes, you can learn how to write jokes if you're an expert at writing half-hour sitcoms, and uh, but but really you don't you don't get to write audience pieces if you're writing one-hour dramas. You don't get to do those. <coughs> Jimmy Fallon does a lot of audience games where he'll, he'll audience games and also games with celebrities, and he creates them, and they're very silly. You don't write those things on on other shows. So this yeah. this tells you how to do all that. Uh, but beyond that, I like to think it's a book as I mentioned about short form comedy. I yeah. call it <coughs> comedy for late night TV, but if you've ever wanted to, to write and produce a commercial parody or, or mm -hmm. do your own sketch and put it up on yeah. Funny or Die or put it up on your website or write monologue jokes for Twitter, write topical jokes for Twitter or write a funny list for a magazine article or do a funny pros and cons piece. Those are all examples of short form comedy and, and I really think until now, a <coughs> little plug for the book, I don't mm -hmm. think there's been a, a, a book written about there how to write that stuff. There, there really, there's this is a th real addition. Th this is like really, if you're a comedian or an improviser or a writer, even even if you're a funny writer and you want to punch up the comedy, there's so much that's thank in you. there. I'm a slow reader, and it was a fast read. Oh, thank so you. So I really, um, I like you had one thing in there about why people laugh. Uh, yeah. You I, had two. I found myself, the more I get into it, I said, <laughs> I have these guidelines and these little tricks and, and tips about how to make something funny. So I, I really felt like I needed to have a reason, like, well, so the, the sound K is funny. Hard con stop consonants are funny. Why? Why would that be? Why is it funnier to, you've probably heard, end on, I call it the laugh trigger, which is the most surprising word in the punchline. Why does that have to be at the end to make the laugh bigger? And so I did a little research. I went online, and, and I'm, I'm going back to, so like Aristotle and, and Hobbes, the philosopher, trying to figure out like <laughs> don't worry, there's not too much of that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a, it's only it's a very short but it chapter, was, but it yeah. explains the, these two theories. There's the the surprise theory of laughter, and the superiority theory mm -hmm. of laughter. And I found that those were the most useful theories to explain why all these these tips and and, and guidelines work. When I read that, it's like yeah. ding 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 ding. I hadn't pu I, I knew surprise. I hadn't really put words to the superiority. We laugh. The superior theory of laughter is we laugh when we feel superior to somebody, which is is really like the banana dark side peel. of comedy. It's the banana peel. It's uh, it's you'll see these uh, these audience games on Jimmy Fallon's yeah. show where it's a, a trivia game, and and if you get the trivia question wrong, if if one guy gets the trivia question wrong, his his friend gets hair ripped off his chest by a professional waxer. It's called wax on, wax off, and that's a, just a clear example of the superiority theory of, of laughter. I'm glad I'm not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it all starts with good jokes, though. I mean, sort of the basic building block. Mm. So how do you make a good monologue joke? Any tips? There's, there's a whole chapter about that. And, and that's, a, that's another example of, of a, a, a topic in comedy that I don't think ha has ever really been dealt with in that level of detail. Yep. Two things. I, I thought about how I write a joke, and I say, okay, I think this is a funny joke. I, I, I think this would get a laugh. What did I do to make to right. line up the words that I way? Yeah, how yeah. did I get there? And then also, I, I just read a lot of monologue jokes. And, and the late night shows, all the monologue jokes, all the topical comedies, pretty much the same from show to show. And that's sort of an indicator that all these writers are basically using the same formulas. They're, they're selecting the news items to make jokes about the same way. And so I just read, I read a ton of these jokes. You can find them online. They're all archived. You can go to, to search on late night jokes. And, and I, I reduced it to, uh, to, to what I call six punchline makers, six techniques for, for manipulating elements in the topic in the news item and also in pop culture to put them together in a basically a surprising way. I to, didn't realize there was so much logic to our profession. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, here it is, yeah. He but, was like uh, the Noam Chomsky doing the deep structure of it, and, but, but giving it words but that I just really hadn't seen. I, I was just fascinated when this, when I said, wait yep. a second, 
is that what they're doing? Would you like to hear an example? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please, I, please. I brought some examples. This oh, is from, good, good, good. Just, just to show you, this is from the best of late night jokes. I got this off a website. Okay, <laughs> here's an example. This is from uh, Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. Both President Obama and former President George W. Bush were interviewed on Face the Nation over the weekend. President Bush said there's a 50% chance his brother Jeb will run for president in 2016. Then he said, but there's an 80% chance he won't. <laughs> and, and I blew the punchline. There's an 80% chance he won't. Okay, so, uh, so that, that uses what I call punchline technique number three. Punchline technique number three is ask a question about the topic and then answer it using an association of something in the topic. So in this case, uh, both President Obama and former President Bush were interviewed at Face the Nation over the weekend. President Bush said there's a 50% chance his brother Jeb will run for president in 2016. So w what is the chance that, that he won't uh, is the question that you could ask. And you answer it using an association of President uh, George W. Bush. And as we all know, the, the commonly accepted association <laughs> of President George W. Bush is he's an idiot. Now that doesn't have to be necessarily true but it's something the audience accepts as true. And that's a, that's right. a general technique for punchlines. <laughs> right. Your punchline has to say something the audience will accept. Uh, so that's punchline technique number three. Uh, we were talking about, I guess I was talking about how all the late night talk show writers seem to write the same way. Same night, one hour later. Here's Late Night with Seth Meyers. Oh, interesting. This weekend, George W. Bush said it's a toss-up whether his brother Jeb will run, for, will run for president in 2016. Bush said there's a 40-40 chance. <laughs> a 40-40 chance. Okay. Same principle, same association. Yeah. George W. Bush is an idiot. Uh, in this case, I would say it's uh, it's also punchline technique. So that's I, an example. I also, thanks. I found, yeah. um, I really liked your technique, too, of, I think a lot of, I can only speak for the comedians, but we sort of wait for that big inspiration to happen. But you actually can nudge it if you make, can you explain to them a little more about a list of associations? I just find that that's like the best tool. It's, it's a very common technique, yeah. Uh, for example, if you have a joke like the George W. Bush joke, it's a lot of the ways of constructing these punchlines involve free associating off what I call the, the handles of the topic, which are the one or two most distinctive elements in the topic, the, the things that make the topic newsworthy. And in this case, it's, oh, George W. Bush was, was on Face the Nation. And we all know he's very rich in associations. So you think of George W. Bush, what do you think of? You think of a former president, you think uh, uh, Texas, you think uh, Iraq maybe, you think maybe frat boy, you think, you think what late night audiences tend to think, because he's a go-to guy for, for not being very smart, you think he's, he's an idiot. And, and that list of associations becomes the raw material for, for constructing punchlines. Mm -hmm. If you have two handles, each one has a list of associations, one technique involves linking the same association on two lists, and that's how you build the surprise into the punchline, is yeah. the, the audience's brain makes a surprise connection between these two elements that you set up. Yeah. And, and the surprise theory of laughter encourages them to and laugh. And it's great when they're both topical, kind of. Yeah. If you can get Ebola over to Bush or something. You do know what I mean. Or, like or let me give, give <laughs> oh you another good, example. Oh, good, oh, good, good. Show and another tell. Another is different, different punchline maker. Punchline maker number two, if okay. I can reduce this. Okay. This is from Conan. <laughs> Scientists have discovered a virus that lowers the intelligence of people it infects. <laughs> okay, when you think of low intelligence and you're thinking pop culture, any names, any suggestions? Ah, ah, bingo. bingo. Here's the punchline. Scientists have discovered a virus that lowers the intelligence of people it infects. The virus is called H1 Kardashian 1. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. Very so nice. You've yeah. done it. You, yeah. you, it's a late night. That's, there you Bam. go. <laughs> Right there. So that's, uh, in this case, the, the punchline maker is, is link the topic to pop culture. Right, right. So you have your associations in your topic, but you also have everybody in pop culture. Right, right, right. Those are quite some link. pictures of her. I don't know if you've seen. I have. Wow. I have. <laughs> wow. Never mind. Okay. So I uh, <laughs> just, um, 
Okay, so I'm thinking of the late night submission pa packet. So we've talked a little bit about the monologue joke. Can you just talk a little bit about desk pieces, like top ten lists, and what it's sure. all about? Uh, desk <laughs> pieces tend to be what uh, what I call, and other people in, in late night writing call, joke baskets. A joke basket is a comedy piece that has a theme to it, but the the jokes within that theme aren't connected to each other. They don't have any story element connecting them. So, for example, at the top ten list, all of the jokes on the top ten list have to do with the topic, but they're not related to each other in any other way. Jimmy Fallon does thank you notes. They're all thank you notes, but there's no story element. Because, they're, it, because it's a joke basket, the whole writing staff can, can write for it. Everybody can throw in jokes. They don't have to worry about them connecting in any story. So you, you tend to get a lot of possible jokes for a piece like that, and the jokes can be interchanged, they can be put in any possible order, any order at all. Uh, so that tends to, to make those pieces funny because everybody's contributing to them. Another good reason to, to do desk pieces, which are joke baskets, is they're refillable. Once you come uh, up with the, the, the idea, concept, yeah. thank you notes, you know, okay, once a week we're going to do thank you notes, we all know how to write them, we just write new jokes for thank you notes. And so it's one less piece you have to create from scratch. So desk pieces are very, very valuable for, for late night talk shows. A, a lot of them do them. I think most of them do them. I don't think Jimmy Kimmel actually does desk pieces, but most of the, most of the shows do. And so that's why I recommend if you're preparing a, a submission packet, a sample for, for one of these late night shows, that you include at least uh, a couple pages of, of new desk piece ideas. Uh, I, I've talked to, to head writers along the way of, of these late night shows, and at least two of them independently have used the same, the same expression. They're worth their weight in gold. A, uh, a, a, a fresh, new desk piece idea. A refillable cup. A, yeah. Cause yeah. It, it, I think Jimmy Fallon also does pros and cons yeah. every week. So he's got two refillable pieces. That's two main comedy pieces he doesn't have to worry about. His head writer and right. the writers don't have to worry about. Right. Easier to write a symphony when you have the structure. Yes, and, oh, and, and uh, one more point is desk pieces are basically, the, the jokes for them are written the same way you'd write a topical joke for monologue. So the, the, a monologue joke, you can think of that as the, the building block for, for many other comedy pieces on a, on a show like this. So if you write a good, solid, topical monologue joke, you know how to craft it using the joke maximizers, you can write desk pieces, you can write a top ten list. So yeah. there's that connection too. So let's see. So it, um, the audience piece, can you just elaborate a little? Sure. On that? The, the audience piece is you get into the semi-scripted area. It's it's where the the host interacts with members of the audience, and there's a scripted element to it, and that the premise is scripted. Uh, Jay Leno used to do this piece where he'd go in the audience, and the, and the idea for the piece would be midnight confessions, <laughs> and and you'd get three or four people in the audience who had just showed up at the show, and, and they were cast from the line. The writers would find these stories, and these people for Midnight Confessions would confess to things <laughs> that they had never told anybody else before. And just the lure of television. Why for do some people reason, do these things? I don't things? know. <laughs> people <laughs> saying these embarrassing things for the first time on national television. Right. <laughs> but they get to be on television. Okay. And it takes, a, it, it takes a certain kind of host uh, to be able to, to enjoy those pieces and do well. And it, to it's, deal. It's, it's crowd work, I yeah, guess you'd call it. Yeah, it's crowd work at yeah. the highest level. I yeah. Think. And then field pieces, can you talk about those? Field pieces also have a semi-scripted element in that the premise is scripted. When, for example, when Jay Leno went out to do jaywalking, uh, the premise was he's going to ask people on the street <laughs> general interest questions that they really should know the answers to. It was to. unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the comedy comes in just seeing the, the ridiculous, incorrect, dumb answers that people give. It was truly amazing. Um, Going back a little bit to nuts and bolts, uh, this was under how to edit a joke, but I loved your joke maximizers. Oh, um, thank you. Can you name some of them for the audience? Uh, sure. Um, end on the laugh trigger I mentioned. Right. Uh, some of these you've probably heard before. The, right. The uh, brevity, shorten as much as possible. When you're writing a joke, it, and this is an example of how I use the surprise theory of laughter to explain well, why, why, sh why should shorter be funnier. Shorter is funnier because then the, the, the listener has less chance to get ahead of you and anticipate what the punchline is going to be. Yeah. So you, you really have to be just brutal about taking out every syllable. If you can use a one-syllable word instead of a two-syllable word, just put that in. Just to, so and that you were saying one flies. way to check yourself is to say it out loud. Yes, 
because then you'll say, oh, I repeated that word, or I don't really need to say that. Uh, yeah, I like fact, number eight, wildly exaggerate. Wildly exaggerate, yeah. It's, uh, uh, let's see if I can remember an example of that. Uh, yeah. Is there any on this? No, I've see. got a couple. One oh, was short. Okay. Four was clarity. Eight clarity. was wildly exaggerate. Nine was specific. Ten was rule of three. So I did know one of them. I, the rule of three, but I, I, I like to think I even refined that a little bit. It's, it's not just a, any list of three is, is funny. Uh, it's uh, it's if you have a punchline. Yeah. Sometimes a way to make the punchline funnier is to is to turn the punchline into a list of three, where the the laugh triggers the third item. So so just saying saying three things, uh, alpha, bravo, delta is not funny. Right. They have to be part of a punchline, and it's a way to make an existing joke funnier. And tell them about priority when you are setting up, even even within just three, you do like strong sure. at the big yeah. Um, it's the way you do it is is the first one in the list is is not funny, the second one in the list is also not funny, and the the third one on the list is a it takes a right turn. It's it's a surprise. It's it doesn't follow the pattern set by the first two, um, and that's what yeah. punches the laugh. So it's it's a part of the mislead. It's extending the the middle of the joke to to <laughs> mislead, get the audience yeah. thinking, continuing to Down think along this road and, and take a left. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite joke you've written? I hate it when people say to me, tell me a joke. I really honestly hate it, so now I'm asking you. You know, um, let me tell you the joke that I wrote today. Oh, good. Do it's not necessarily my favorite. Do you tweet I do. stuff every day? I do. Every day I try, up to, your muscle? I try to tweet a topical joke. Yeah. <laughs> so oh. follow him on a, <laughs> at Joe Toplin, right? At Joe Toplin. Yeah, yeah. Follow me. I'll follow you back. Okay, here's my joke today. Not necessarily my favorite, it was my joke today. Kim Kardashian took nude photos and wants to break the internet. Based on the photos, she could break the internet if she sits on it. <laughs> okay. That is We're actually a great joke. That having Thank just you. My seen the, the photos. Last five minutes. Yeah, that was you were talking very, about the very, photos. Very well done. You have to watch the, the naked you have to look at the naked photos of Kim it Kardashian. If you're gonna write comedy, you have to do it. It's it it's a requirement. You've got to look at all that filth. You, yeah, I know. It's not our fault. <laughs> you know, it's homework. It's it's just homework. It's better homework. than problem sets and uh, <laughs> yeah. doing equations, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I know. that's um, Photoshop. Anyway, the, uh, do you have any joke you wish you you'd written? You know, like a, a friend's joke that you just really <laughs> admire. So many, I, I, nothing. Let me just tell you one of my friends. Please, well, I'm, yeah. I'm always imitating my <laughs> friends. Uh, uh -huh. We went to the same Catholic co-ed high school in Brockton, Mass. We all had very thick accents, and I got mine teased out of me. But Christine Hurley still got the accent. She's married to a firefighter. She's got five children. Yeah. What did you say? She said, I was working as a waitress. And uh, I decided, you know, I, I just had it. I just couldn't do it anymore. So I go into my boss and I say, I quit. And he says, Christine, you can't quit because uh, you have to give two weeks' notice. And she said, All right. After two weeks, you might notice I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I think I think when you're in the biz, you have a friend's material that you're just yeah. there like, you love That's it brilliant. so yeah. much. Do you yeah, know? I, it's, it made me I, wish I'd, I'd kept my accent, you know, the, because the accent, it, it enhances it, it does. right? It gives it, it really a, does. A, yeah. a, a second, a second <laughs> level. Um, could you tell us one thing we don't know about Jay and one thing we don't know about Dave? I, I don't know if you ever want to work in late night again. <laughs> um, hmm. Because you've really been on the inside. You know everything. Uh, let's see. Can I tell us about Dave? Sure, why not? Uh, Dave occasionally would smoke cigars. And along the way, he would, uh, he would periodically give up cigars. Because, you know, cigars are bad for you. And he did it once or twice. And every time... He did it. He would have these, these fabulous Cuban cigars that, that were I in his, his, his storehouse. Of yeah. So he would go out to his assistant who put the boxes of cigars on his desk, and, and he would, would leave them, and he would invite writers to take cigars. So, uh, oh, that's nice. So I got, I got some, some amazing uh, Cuban cigars from Dave Letterman. <laughs> that's um, did it create it, a habit, or can you smoke a regular cigar now? I, I did a or lot of that. I did a lot of the lampoon. That was one of the things oh, I, I right. learned to do in the I've lampoon. I've heard they have very rich food and. <laughs> yes, wonderful parties. Uh, uh, 
I actually um, had a son on the business side. So we got so to... So he's told you some stories, probably, up to yeah, the point unfortunately, where... Hopefully not a lot of stories. Just <laughs> the, the, the less I know, I think, the better. Um, how about, you know, when you're backstage? I, I guess what I've always wondered, too, is... Do you like write the jokes during the day? Do you actually watch the show or do you just kick back and have a Snickers in the privacy of your office? What do you do? When, if I'm personally involved in a piece, I like to be in, in the studio. To see. Yeah, to, to, see, to the see the reaction. Sometimes <laughs> there was, I used to do this a, a lot on The Tonight Show, but even on, on Late Night, we would do this piece where we dropped stuff off a five-story tower. That was the piece. Oh, I Dave goes to the five story who tower. Who ever thought of this dropping stick? This was a man who thought of this. The one be there, like, I got to clean it up. But yeah. why? Why do they drop pumpkin? It's hilarious. But who thought of it? I, I, I can't I, even. I'm not exactly sure, but I, th I think it might have been our, our, our outside prop master, Dan Well, Blyer. God bless them because. Because he came in and said. It's amazing. Because uh, George Meyer, I believe, in the before I got to the show, uh, he created uh, crushing stuff with a steamroller. Oh, that's <laughs> so it's just these these little toys and these cans of beer and stuff just crushed with a steamroller. So it was a, an extension right, of that. Like, right, right, Like any comedy in late night, if it works, you do it again. Oh, right. Change it a little bit, do it again until people get sick of it. So I was wondering, we were d dropping stuff off a five-story tower, and, <laughs> and they were airing that piece. And so it was ro they were rolling the tape in during the show. And I went out to the studio, and I was just watching the audience. I wanted to see, are they enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. And they're just wrapped. They're looking up at the monitors, just loving it. I said, well, I guess they still enjoy it, so we'll keep doing it. So sometimes I, you need that, that to see that audience reaction to, to know how well it's going over. And I, on The Tonight Show, I did the same thing. If a piece was going to play, I just uh, wanted to... Oh, of course. I wanted to, to hear, yeah, what, yeah, how, yeah. To hear, hear the, the volume of the, of the audience, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're backstage... Do, do you have a favorite guest who was ever on one of the shows? Is there somebody who is just wonderful? The most, well, there's there's a couple of guests like that. I, I always had fun with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It, oh he, he'd come on the show, and he has such a such an outsized comic personality, a per persona. He's this this muscle man, and, and it was just it was always fun to write. I would write these little cold opens. A cold open is is a little scene or a sketch. <laughs> That, that is the first thing you see when the, the show starts before even the opening credits. And so they have be to be willing to do it, too. You have to That's know. The, yeah. Yeah. You, 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 have, you have the script, and it usually goes to the talent department, <laughs> and they'll run it past the, the celebrity. So he's al he was always up for anything. Okay. He always d was very fun in anything that I ever wrote for him, and, and I got to, to hang out with Arnold Are there any celebrities who just say, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do anything. I'm a straight person. I'm a dramatic actor. Um, there actually, there actually is one story that I think I can tell now, but it's, I can tell now, it's in my book. Uh, it's, it involves Tony Perkins. Tony Perkins, uh, Norman Bates in Psycho, we all know him as Norman Bates in Psycho. I thought that the audience might enjoy a cold open with, with Tony Perkins, where yeah. he plays this psycho character, that Norman Bates, backstage, and he has an interaction with, with uh, Dave in the, in the makeup room. So I wrote the script, gave it to the talent department. They ran it past Tony Perkins. The next thing I know that morning is the, the talent department person, the segment producer, calls me on the phone and says, Tony Perkins is on the line. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> and, uh, and this never happens. The, the, oh, the, the celebrity guests never call the writer <laughs> unless there's, there's something wrong. So Tony's on the line, and he's, he's very polite and, and doesn't raise his voice, but he's, he's upset and annoyed that I'm... I, I wrote this Norman Bates thing for him. He's really on the show to to promote his new movie. Uh, it's, oh. I think it was Crimes of Passion, uh -huh. this new this new passion project of his, and, uh, and, and he really doesn't. He's annoyed that he, he doesn't understand why I don't appreciate that, that he's trying yeah. to change his image and move away from that. So uh, the I thing apologize that built for his house. So, exactly. So so I, I apologize to him. Um, we don't do the cold open. A year and a half later, Psycho Four. Directed by <laughs> Tony Perkins, starring Tony Perkins as Norman Bates. He's back. He's back doing his character again. Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 unfortunately, I didn't get my little cold open. Oh. So, so that's that's kind of, he's yeah. an example of someone who took his, his some people his are project. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very uh, when you're when you're Jimmy Fallon show and and you're doing a lot, you're working a lot with celebrities. Yeah, that's very important to get celebrities who will play along because a lot of them just 
want to come on the show and, and chat and, and promote their project and, yeah. uh, and just leave. So let's talk about some of the shows. Like, just I'll say the name of the host of the late night show and just say <laughs> one word. We, we can do this another way too, but let's do it just quickly. Like, so Kimmel, one word. Uh, edgy. Edgy. Uh, Ferguson. Uh, affable. <laughs> uh, Conan. Smart. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Leno. Everyman. Letterman. Uh, quirky. Stewart. Quirky, quirky. Smart. That's interesting. Uh, Fallon. Lovable. Ah, yeah, that's very Colbert. Smart. Oh, this is interesting. I mean, I. Seth, I and Seth Myers. And Seth Myers. Uh, smart. Come, he's you, a writer. Does anyone see a theme here? Um, <laughs> But what's interesting to me is, for none of them did you say funny. I, I, I would have, I, I, when I did this to myself, I would have, mm -hmm. I, would, I, I actually thought that was going to be your answer for most of them. Just funny, 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 funny. Well, that's, that's but I mean, the, I guess that goes without the saying. Minimum, that's the minimum right, common minimum denominator. Chip. Is like, right. you got to be funny. But, but then I, love, I actually how do you, love. How do you differentiate their but styles? I, but I love that you said smart. I love that. Because, the, the, yes, obviously they're all funny. That's, that's right. why they're still on the air. Right. But it, and in, in fact, I, I think they're all basically the same character. They you, all play. You yeah, you said this. Yeah. The same but different. Can you? Yeah, they're all elaborate they're all uh, likable every men who who poke fun at this playful but irreverent. Yeah. They're, they're all basically playful but irreverent. So the question is, is there any difference at all between them? And sometimes people will. When I'm talking to people about writing a submission packet for a particular show, right, right. I'm saying, "Oh, they're all basically the same." But then I think about it, and no, there are there are differences. I like the difference. The one I'm, I should let you say it, maybe, but, but just cer ahead. certain yeah. hosts, they have slightly different ways of speaking. There are yeah. certain pieces that some hosts will do, comedy pieces that other hosts won't do, and you do have to figure that out if you're going to write a, a, a tailored submission packet. I like how you said, like Leno, comes from the stand-up world, and Jimmy Fallon is more of a comic actor. And I thought that was just a very good little insight. And also, Fallon does more musical stuff. Yeah. And I think that's why he's being successful. He's he's kind of a new version of the old thing. Oh my goodness, same but different. Yep. You know, just like. Yeah, it's. I think they're all doing the same sort of comedy. It's just the emphasis. The emphases are different from from show to show. And any difference between a daytime talk show comedy, say Ellen or Meredith Vieira, and late night? Just some some of the, the minor differences in the personalities, the personas of the host, but otherwise it's the same sort of comedy. Yeah. Ellen Ellen does a lot of audience games, I think, still. Yeah, 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 yeah. And dances and goes uh, around. Sure, a lot of musical stuff. Uh, I think she also does field pieces. Well, she'll take the camera out and do comedy pieces. So what's so going to happen when Colbert goes on the air? What do you think? How is it going to shake out? I think he'll be real competition. I think he'll be amazing. For, but for but Jimmy he's losing Fallon. the conservative persona. So. Right. He's not going to do the character. He said so that. So that will be, you know. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, my guess is he might want to do <coughs> maybe more uh, more detailed. He might go into topical comedy, uh, comedy based on the news a little bit more than, than uh, Jimmy Fallon does because that's, yeah. that's what Colbert has been doing for right, years. It's right, all about right. the news. Oh, right, right, right. So right, I think right. he'll take, probably take that with him. And I thought it was an interesting evolution in all of Late Night, maybe started by Stuart more of the video in the back illustrating thing, to the point where it's even in the monologues now, they insert video. Yeah, uh, that's that's something that the Jay was doing, too. Oh, he was? He used to call them oh. drop-ins, yeah. Oh. So he'd do the monologue. Jay would do an unusually long monologue. He'd have 30 jokes in the monologue, say. So to break it up, uh, occasionally there would be a, a monologue joke with a visual punchline. It could be, and here's the book. And the prop guy would hand in the, the joke book, or take a look at the, what they're doing over at the American Airlines, and it'll be the the, the funny oh, uh, yeah. little short video. So, so Jay Jay did that too. Oh, maybe I didn't even, know that. that oh he yeah. Preceded. I was going to say predeceased, but that's the wrong word. But yeah. I'm a little dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. But you know. No, and that, and that was the term. Occasionally, I'd be down in the morning talking to him, and he'd say, "Oh, how about this as a drop in?" And he'd, he'd suggest oh, something probably based on one of the jokes that he read and he, he thought oh this would be nice to actually see this prop or, or see that 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 new ad and we could do a doctored ad or something like that well i just yeah. want to take five more minutes with my asking you something and then we're going to open it to the audience because i know there are a lot of playwrights and writers here but sure 
if you could, I think a lot of people, what they're looking for on the streaming video and people who showed up tonight is how to, how to write an amazing submission packet. And I'm sorry, because I know this is like a huge chapter, but whatever advice you want to give them. Well, there, there are different kinds of submission packets. Uh, I'll assume that, that people Let's are... Let's say for late night. For, for a specific show? Yeah. Okay. The, the, the most important thing to do is you watch the show a lot. D do your research. So hopefully the show is a show you watch anyway, so you'll already have, have seen a lot of the episodes. Uh, you'll know what comedy, what sort of comedy pieces the show does. Does it do desk pieces? Does the show ever take the camera out of the studio? Uh, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, I don't think they ever take the camera out of the studio. So you wouldn't want to, if you're writing a oh, submission packet, you oh. wouldn't want to say, oh, I'm going to do field oh. pieces. Because oh. right now they, they aren't doing that sort of pieces. So study the show. Oh, that's interesting. You can also go online and just, for I think most of these shows, you can just go to Wikipedia and search on Conan sketches or or Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon sketches, and, and fans will have listed short descriptions of the sketches they do. So it's, uh -huh. a, it's a very easy way to do research on what the show does. And then based on that, make a decision, okay, here's the sort of things, the sort of comedy pieces he does a lot of, I'm gonna do those types of comedy pieces. If he does audience games, in the case of Jimmy Fallon, I'm gonna write some audience games. If he does desk pieces like thank you notes, Pros and, cons. and Joe I'm lays this out in the appendix, which is very helpful. I have sort a, of, it gives you a road map of right, and I also have, which I think this book, I think this book is the only way you can get it formally. It's a, a generic submission packet, so it shows you how to format a submission. I, I think that was worth the price of the book alone. Oh, actually. thank you. You know that uh, was pretty I, amazing. I, I actually hadn't prepared that until it was the. the I, I teach this at the People's Improv Theater, uh -huh. and then in one of my early classes, one of the students mm -hmm. asked the obvious question. Well. Can we actually see one of these submissions you're teaching us to write? Because we don't know what one looks like. Right. And I said, sure. And, so I, and then you have some together. tips in there about how to get it seen. That's another whole thing. Yes, it's uh, it's it's two things. It's it's writing a great submission, and then it's just figuring out who you can give it to, who might know somebody, who can get it to somebody on the show, who might walk it over to the head writer. Yeah. And that's where. <laughs> it's important to, to stay involved in the comedy community. So take improv classes, take sketch classes, do stand-up, mm -hmm. because some shows have writers who also do stand-up, and they'll go into a club, they'll see you doing your stand-up, and I know this has happened to at least one person I heard of this happened to. She was, she was doing stand-up, a, a writer from one of the late night shows saw her and invited her to, to submit a packet. Wow. That's great. So, so there's your opportunity. So, yeah. so just meet people who can, and become, become friends with them. So, so when you do slip them your packet, it's not like opportunistic. It's right. You know, hey, would you look at this and tell me what you think, and then yeah. go from there. Yeah, this is great advice. So, I think we'll <clears throat> open it up to the writers. Does anybody have a question back there? I write plays and musicals, and I need a, like a part-time job to make money because these things do not. Are plays and musicals an acceptable background, a respected background, or a, a poo-poo background, and I should really explore the comedy circuit for this type of work? Um, first question, no, absolutely. Late-night shows are, I believe, just totally embarrassed that they don't have more, more women on their staff. So if you write a, a great submission for a show and a guy writes a great submission for, for the show and, and both packets are, are equal evidence that, that either writer could go on staff and immediately start turning out comedy that the show could put on the air, I think, I think being a woman would, would give you an edge just for, for that reason. R routinely, you'll see articles in, in the, the various media about how few, how few women are represented on, on the late night writing staffs, and, and the staffs are very aware of that, and they, it, they, they would welcome you with open arms, as, assuming you know that you turn in a. Do you a have great to be young? Packet. No, 
No, uh, it's certainly uh, plenty of the the writers on the existing shows on the shows now. They've been with the show a while, and, and yeah, they're not they're not young. <laughs> I was if, if I was working on uh, on those shows, um, no, n no. They, so like you. You haven't aged out. Like, if you wanted to do it, you could go back. I'd like to think I could, yeah. Um, so funny is funny. I believe <coughs> They funny, respect the funny. Funny is funny, yeah, because it's all about making the head writer's job easier. And oh, certainly this is when I was great. A, yeah, you're solving this problem. Yes, I, yes, certainly when I was a head writer, just, I don't care who you are, just put, put sheets of paper in, in, my, in the slots in my door where, yeah. where the assignments go, and... And that's all I ask. Yeah. And and your second question was uh, pl playwriting. Yeah. I would say any any writing that you've done like that is is a credential. It shows you're a serious writer. You you enjoy writing. You you do writing. You, you you've been doing it for a while. And oh by the way, I have this submission packet I wrote for you, mm -hmm. Jimmy Fallon show. Would you take a, a look at it? And and people would say, yeah, this is a writer who knows how to put words together. Let, let, let's see if she can write for Jimmy Fallon and, and write the sort of comedy we're doing. But, but yeah, I think that automatically would, would get you read, get your material read. I know, I know writers, there was a writer on Late Show who was a, he, he wrote Broadway, he's written a Broadway show, at least one Broadway show. Oh, he went from there yeah. and he also works oh, on cool. the, he wrote numbers for, for the Tony Awards. He wrote one of those parody songs. For, and I know somebody Awards. got picked up just from their Twitter jokes. Somebody yeah, in there's, Indiana or something. There are all these, yeah. All I, these I, little stories. A writer on Seth Meyers, I think. He was yeah. a, he had a Twitter feed and he, he tweeted jokes and somebody saw, somebody who was on the staff of, of Late Night with Seth Meyers saw the jokes, said, hey, this, th th these are funny jokes. Got in touch with the guy. He's now, I believe he's still on staff, but uh, he turned out he was a 40-year-old IT guy. <laughs> Lives in Indiana yeah. or someplace like that. Has a family, <laughs> and he was just uh, yeah. Thanks for me. that's a great example. He was just hired on the basis of, of his writing. Do they still do faxes, or is that old? Uh, I mean, who has a fax it's machine? A, uh, but I mean, faxing, the concept. It, the concept of, of faxing is sometimes to to supplement the, the monologue jokes that they get from their their staff, their staff writers. Some late night hosts may or may not accept outside submissions from a selected uh, screen number of, right. of, of what they call faxers. In this case, I'm sure they, they email, email their jokes. Right. And they get paid by the joke. Uh, I don't know for sure who's doing it now, if any of them still are, but it's, it's against Writer's Guild rules. You can't, oh, it a is? Writer's Guild signatory. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. Writer's Guild, a show that signed the Writer's Guild minimum basic agreement oh. cannot, cannot use the writing of a non-Writer's Guild member. That's, oh. that's a, a big push. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying I don't know who does it, I, if, I if see, any of them do I it. But, but it has happened in the past. You'd get paid $75 right, a joke, right. I think, was the, the right. going rate. You had a question? Yeah, what, what is the uh, integrity level of people submitting material, especially if it's very, very good, and especially if they are you know, the kind of ideas that you say that have really had legs? You mean the the, the reader the reader's integrity on the, the show? Readers, yeah, the readers in the show. I mean, it's definitely a problem in when it comes to pitching movies. You, you know, it's it's a known problem. Yeah. You can't copyright an idea. You can copyright, and if it's a very high concept comedy idea for a film, one can change the female protagonist or the mm -hmm. male protagonist to the opposite, and you can make this country that country. And you know, if a really high concept comedy idea for a film can be altered and. Um, and I just wonder, I mean, it must be something that people are concerned about if they do a fabulous packet with, with 65 jokes and 30 of them are ones that they already use in stand-up and they bring down the house. Um, you know, there's got to be a temptation level. One would hope that they want to hire that writer because it could be the goose that lays the golden egg. But I just wonder right. if, what your thoughts are about that. I, I, I certainly understand that there are ideas that, that get barred in the, in the future world where a writer will come in and, and pitch his or her take on a feature. This is how I'd write it. Yeah. And that writer will leave, yeah. and then the next writer will come in and pitch, pitch right. his or her take, and, right. and the producer right. will remember the first mm -hmm. writer and yeah. say, well, how about if you do this? And suddenly right. those ideas will work right. its way. Uh, in late night, I've never seen that happen. It's, I, I think it's mostly because the writers, well, stuff gets passed around, and you wouldn't want to be known as the writer who 
who has to steal material. I think writers want to get their own stuff on the air because that's how that's how you're judged in late night is do you write stuff that gets on the air? And occasionally the shows like occasionally a host will will perform a joke on the show and and a faxer or a freelancer will will send a message to whoever coordinates the monologue and say oh I saw my joke on the show I, I, I was I was thrilled you know please please send me my seventy five dollars <laughs> and and as I just I showed a little yeah. while ago with the the, the two shows yeah. Seth Meyers and to be found basically yeah. doing the same joke it's all Some, the writers are, so sometimes there's yeah. spontaneous combustion that yeah. topic was just that was just laying right there yeah so a lot of people are gonna write a joke off and of the it. same techniques to, to create yeah. a joke off that topic so but uh, so I've never known it where there was an actual theft of a joke and then it wound its way. It, it wound it's up such a huge yeah. no-no. It's uh, I mean you can just really screw yourself in yeah. stand-up if, if if anybody gets any wind of it. And we, it, it's not quite the same as either of your fields. The the movie thing that would drive me crazy because mm. it, it is concept, and yours. But in our field, like if 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 we hear somebody else do a friend's joke. We often, on their behalf, will say, "Gee, did you know that so and so was doing the same thing? You might want to work it out." Meaning, either yeah. you back off, or my friend should back off, or people will make joint custody of jokes. I've seen that. Like you can do it all any place outside New York, but I get New York. That's how wow, yeah. well, we tend to be somewhat honorable. And and then the other thing is, we all, some people less my favorite, but the operating assumption early on was the first one to get it to TV wins. I, I mm -hmm. don't I don't like that one but and <laughs> wow. but the other thing that we always say too is just you just 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 write more. It, it, it's like put it in the rearview mirror. Yeah. There are gonna be some mm, and you know what, rather than make yourself all stressed inside I'm not talking high concept. What what mm -hmm. yours yours is really worth a lot of dinero. But like for a single joke. Right, like absolutely. we we it's encouraging to hear that, for instance, the shows themselves are pretty responsible. Say to themselves, oh, you know, we really don't need any new writers right now, but gee, those are you know good ideas. And you know, like we're, you know, we'll keep it in mind. But in the meantime, yeah. it's really very encouraging to hear that because it's really, you know, there's yeah. a lot of bad bad behavior in other parts. Yeah, of the I've, <laughs> I've never seen it happen, and and frankly, if it if it did happen, just the fact that a writer's submission is actually getting read by by somebody on the show, that's. <laughs> That's rare enough that uh, if a joke, and it, I don't think it would ever, a joke would ever get stolen, but if it did, that means the packet was read. And, and if the joke was good enough to, to be stolen, that packet will get remembered, and, and that writer may be top of the list when a slot opens up. So not that a joke would ever get stolen, but even if it were, I think that would be a small, pr a pr small price of admission to, to yeah. get your stuff yeah. read. Cause yeah. A joke, five jokes, it's not <laughs> Yeah. A, a concept for a blockbuster feature mm. film or something. Well, it's nice yeah. to know the head writer is a moral guy. Do you know what I mean? I think the tone starts at the top, as with any kind of leadership. Like, you know, you yeah. just sort of set the tone and the behavior. Right, yeah, and it then, comes from the top. Even yeah. Yeah, from the from the host. Even the host. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a relaxed host who is having fun, then the whole staff has fun. Yeah. 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 Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm a writer and a performer, so I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Do Many writers become performers, or vice versa. And what do you think is the difference <laughs> in personality between a writer for these shows and a performer on these shows? Uh, there are a lot of writer performers in late night. I think, I think Conan is is well known for having a lot of writer performers on his show. Brian Kiley. Yeah, I yeah, love Brian. just 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 brilliant, brilliant guys. <laughs> and and Seth Meyers too. I think went out of his way to to hire as writers people who also had performing experience because I think he anticipated doing what he did on uh, on Saturday Night Live. He did weekend updates, so he'd be doing the news, but then the character would come in and sit next to him and they'd have a, a little sketch. So he wanted people on staff uh -huh. who could do that. Who were comfortable. Sure, performing yeah. and also writing, so doing double duty. So, so yeah, I think there's a, a definite opportunity for writer performers. The difference in personalities Dun, 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 yeah, dun, dun, you, you want to be on camera, or don't you? I would occasionally, actually, pretty routinely, anytime there was a, a little bit part where they needed a security guard standing in the back of a little pre-tape or something, I just happened to fit the uniform and the, and the wardrobe, and and I was the guy who would get tapped to to be the cop or the 
the security guard or the general or the SWAT member. Uh, <laughs> but I, w I didn't seek that out. It was just kind of, it was fun. But mm, that's not what I was there for. I'd prefer to write lines for the, for the people on camera. Um, Alan? How would you compare the experience of working with Jay Leno as, uh, to working with Dave Letterman? Jay was, I, I think you could call Jay more of an extrovert maybe and, and Dave more of an introvert. So Jay during the day was was a little more accessible if you wanted to drift in and, and uh, pitch an idea or run something past him. It was a little, it was a little easier to, to pitch ideas and, and, and have those impromptu meetings. Dave liked his, his day a little bit more structured. He liked to, to keep to himself a lot of the time. So it was a little harder. You had to sort of make, make an appointment to get in and pitch stuff. Uh, so I think that's probably the, the biggest difference. But uh, just both very funny guys, obviously. They were both on for decades. And, uh, and we're going to miss Dave. Yeah. Kind of a change in, yeah. a change in our cultural landscape yeah. very soon. Yeah. And certainly when, when Jay left also, that was a... Oh, yeah. After. But he's going to come back, I get the feeling? Well, what? he does, have a, going he does on. have a CNBC show now. It's a, oh. it's a show that where he finally gets to fully indulge his, his love of cars. It's a, oh, right, it's a right, car right. show. He has right, this, right. this very popular website, Jay's Garage. And so he's turned that into a... I think it's a weekly primetime show on CNBC. If, if you ever want to give yourself a treat, go see Jay Leno live. Because he does crowd yeah. work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like... Comedy is meant to be theater and to interact, and the camera, you know, he couldn't yeah. show that side of him, and he's quite good at it. And yes, and, and his 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 act, his stand-up act, is really not what he did on Tonight Show. Right. And I think it's just a matter of, on the Tonight Show, he understood that if you're if you're hosting the Tonight Show, your job is to, <laughs> to do to do the number one show on television in late night, yeah. and that means just appealing to to a wide, wide audience. Yeah. There was a, a quote that I read that it was a quote of Johnny Carson's. And the quote was something like, Johnny said, there's New York and Los Angeles, and there's every place in between. And if you're hosting The Tonight Show, you have to appeal to, to every place in between. Because oh. that's, <laughs> that's where most of the viewers are. So that, if you're, if you're a smart host, you, yeah. you say, that's my audience. Right. I'll do material to, to appeal to that audience. But, <laughs> but now he's doing his stand-up, and he can just be funny. He right. can just do right. stuff that he, he wants to himself. do. Anybody else? Yep. Can you talk a bit more about uh, writing for stand-up comedy, and especially how do you prepare your material? How do you make sure you tailor your material to different types of audiences oh. in different regions or different cultures? How That's Sure, that's, that's probably more of a Jane question. Well, She's it, the it's, act, it's very hard to get to the universals. That's it, like the goal of every comedian is to have the, those jokes that will work no matter where, when, who. Those are few and far between. Yeah. I'm always customizing. I, I did a show up in Boston last night. I got home at 1.15. Oh, <laughs> God. I like to be like Jay Leno, a comedy warrior. He used oh. to drive the three hours down here to do five or ten minutes and then drive back to Boston. That's dedication. I did that last night. <laughs> uh, I'm too old for this. But anyway. But But you work in the much, local references, but I guess. But pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like last night I opened with, uh, uh, I'm Jane. I'm originally from Brockton, but I'm not going to hurt you. It's, it's a very <laughs> tough town up yeah. there if you're from up that way. So you try to think, uh, you, you open up, lo in any situation with stand-up, open up local. Just talk about anything in the room. You know, the lights are so bright, the, the, we got a camera here, you know, we got these things. Mm -hmm. it just, do you know what I mean? You just talk about uh, weather, anything that we all have in common. It's like Tip O'Neill said, all mm -hmm. politics is local, right. all comedy is local. Open local, invite them on your ride, and then, and then do your act. If you go straight to, it's it's like going straight to sex with no foreplay. Well, that's mm -hmm. a terrible analogy. I'm sorry, but I, I just yeah. thought of that. That's really awful. Well, that'll get the audience on your side. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Have sex but with all of them. It's yeah. just, you know, engage. and Just think of that one word, connect, up front. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of, who are those people? I always walk an audience before I do a show. I want to know. My first question when I get hired, 
is who's the audience. Uh -huh, it right. should be what's your budget, but yeah. I always say who's the audience and the American yeah. Heart Association called me and is going to give me a great amount of money. We're really a cancer family, but <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I could do lupus if I had to, you know. It, and, and I think it might have been Jay Leno who, who I read this about and he would go into an, a, like a, a, he's doing a corporate engagement, he's right, going to do right, Stanford right, for a totally corporation. Up front, yeah. And, and again, it may not have been Jay, but but he'll talk to somebody who knows the company. Right. Uh, who's the, the top salesman? Right. Who's who's the guy with the, the yeah. been married the most? Who's the guy who's known as being a playboy? And he'll just oh, he'll have those fantastic. jokes. Yeah. And he'll just who's the competition? Plug those, plug yeah, those yeah. types into the joke, and suddenly yeah. he has a customized joke a customized joke for that particular. When company. you cut, you just open about yeah. them. It's about them, and then you bring them. Yeah. To you, but Once I you get them on your side. I did a, I did a thing at Harvard and. I'd never entertained in front of the President Dear Faust before. So I said to one of her staffers, one word quick about President Faust to you. She said, pantsuit. So I go up and I say, and it was such a piddling little joke, but it was customized for them. I just said, uh, it's so nice to be here tonight. I'm so happy to have the President with us, uh, <laughs> Drew Faust. Faust being an old Indian, a Native American word, you have to say, an old Native American <laughs> right. word meaning pantsuit. <laughs> you know, so that was, and then she'd just written the killed. book about the Civil War. It killed, right? Yeah, no, yeah, it, was, sure. it, was, it was good. <laughs> and, and then she'd written the book about the Civil War, on death in the Civil War, and they wow, this is going to be gangbusters. <laughs> right. You know, just like, what a catchy title. Anyway, so it's it just thrilled. Just, it's like, wow, she's talking about if, me. She's yeah, if you do anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can be just someone you see in the front doing something, something you saw coming in the room, something mm -hmm. on your ride there. I always pre-interview. Like the Today Show, you know why you're so good or people are good on the Today Show? They pre-interview them. Mm -hmm. And for these shows, the producers call up and say, blah, 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 blah. They, if you give a good answer about it, those are the questions that are put in front of Dave, right? That's right. It's all, a, a lot of times the host will just take the, the, the suggested questions that have been prepared and just set them aside and just talk about what he or she is interested in, right. but, but yeah, there's always that safety blanket of, or that, that safety net of, of the pre-interview questions that elicit the, the humorous anecdotes right. uh, that are going to be the most entertaining. Yeah. You know, you wonder why their hit ratio is so great. It's because they're pre-interviewed. Yep. Um, I kind of a fan thing first. Do you have anything to do with Oswald Bates um, as a living color? Oh. That, that I would love to hear about that. I, and, and but speaking of that as well, I, like Oswald Bates was like so amazing the first time it was shown. But Damon Wayans was talking nonsense, and at the end it says, "Give to the United Negro College Fund." Oh yeah. The wave. And was I, that in the pilot? Because I I did not work on the pilot, oh, and my and, God. and I just worked on the first season. But but I remember the sketch. Yeah, it was very funny. <laughs> in my mind, it's like a Greta Garbo. It's like so incredible, and it got used again and again and again, and it didn't. Uh -huh. I felt like you didn't know when to quit, when to put that aside. And I wonder if you have that, like, oh, let's do that thing again. And you know, it's getting stale, and it's sort of spoiling the whole. It's like, oh, the salt is really good on the dish. Can we just keep adding more salt? It's it's very tempting to keep to keep repeating a joke oh. to keep repeating yeah, when a do comedy you know piece. To move on when the audience stops laughing. Yeah, and if it's it's the easy answer, if the audience still seems to be enjoying it, then there's a temptation to keep doing it. If people are still laughing at Chris Christie is fat jokes, <laughs> then the host is going to keep doing them. Right. That's why not. The audience seems to be enjoying them, even though I personally think that's a little bit uh, worn out. That that particular joke. Yeah. Uh, it's just because it's it's such a volume operation, trying to write enough comedy to fill the show. That the last thing you're looking for is is reasons to throw out stuff that that is uh, that is still working. Some shows, I'm sure, have higher standards, and that's like <laughs> the writers themselves will say, "You know, we're not going to do this anymore." But in general, there's enough opportunity to do yeah. new stuff that, that you can also do stuff that's still working, which you've done a while. Like uh, like George W. Bush's dumb jokes, <laughs> you know, which were on... Chris Christie is fat. It's that one adjective often <laughs> that gives you the handle, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, fat. It's it's short. I think that's one of my punchline makers, right? Number one. <laughs> uh, right. Brevity. Keep brevity, it as short brevity, as possible. Brevity. So one-syllable words are going to be funnier. Anybody else? Yeah, We've got to wrap it. Question. Yeah, just one more. And nobody. in the back. In the back. In the back. Oh, sorry. What? I had a question as to uh, comparing writing opportunities in LA versus New York. Oh, LA good question. That's a good question. I think it uh, it depends on what sort of writing you're interested in. 
for late night? Right. I think most of the late night shows are in New York now. Um, I think there are five. There's Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, Colbert for now, uh, uh, John Stewart, Stewart, and Dave. That's five, right? Any more? I think uh, isn't Larry Wilmore's new show? He's going to have a new show. He's replacing. He's replacing uh, Stephen Colbert when Stephen Colbert takes over the Late Show. I'm almost positive he's going to be in New York. Uh, so who's in L.A.? Jimmy Kimmel, Craig Ferguson, who is going to be replaced by James Corden, a British guy. And I think they're going to be producing that out there. So that's that's two shows out there and, you know, six. And, and Conan, right, three. Uh, so three out there, six here. I guess it depends. So, But more sitcoms out there, maybe? But, uh, yeah, definitely more sitcoms and, and one-hour shows out there. So uh, I would say L.A. if that's what you're interested in, but, but New York if you're interested in late night, unless you have total flexibility and you have your heart set on, on uh, Jimmy Kimmel or Conan or, or James Corden, then by all means write a submission tailored for one of those shows, and, and if, you, if you get a chance, move out if you can. One has sunshine. Uh, one has sunshine, and it, it's the weather is beautiful. It's it's fantastic. It's it's all about show business if you're in L.A. It's there's no getting away from it. It's just it's it's part of the culture from top to bottom, pretty much. Uh, and that's different in New York. In New York, there are people who do all sorts of things, and and it's not all about show business. So if you want to live show business 24 hours a day or as com come as close to that as, as, as possible, I would say LA is better for that. If you want to do show business in a, in a context of people who are doing other stuff, uh, I would say New York. We, uh, my family moved to LA to work on, on sitcoms and, and eventually Tonight Show. We were there for six years. Eventually we moved back and it was basically a, a lifestyle thing. I grew up in Boston and, and I just like the East Coast. Uh, lifestyle better we we have two sons and we were going to get into schools and i i, I wanted to we, we both wanted to send our sons to, to east coast schools just because that's how i grew up and i thought the educational level was a little easier to get here the, the, the education we wanted to give our kids so that was why we came back can we have a round of applause for joe please? Uh, thank you thank you If and you thank have you for, anybody thank you for creative, oh, thank you, Jane. This was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.